I'm Paul Turner, Head of Geography here at Beedale School. Welcome to my classroom. As a teacher, I've been interested in data and data skills for a while now. More broadly though, my passion in geography lies with challenging people's stereotypes. And this is where data can be a really useful tool in helping to show what the world is really like and challenge people's misconceptions. It's a bit of a cliche, but my passion for geography really started with uh, a really good secondary school teacher. Um, one of my fondest memories is at geography lessons where we had these big chalkboards and um, we'd come into the class and there'd be this amazing colourful um, image across the wall and we'd spend a lot of time copying those images so it wasn't necessarily I guess the best um, teaching methods but it was a really uh, engaging or he was a really engaging character and it meant that my enthusiasm for the subject grew. At college, I took quite a scientific route and chose maths, physics, chemistry and geography. Uh, what it meant was lots of these subjects were kind of experimental and practical based. So we were doing experiments in uh, physics and then also field working in um, geography as well as experiments in chemistry. Now, it also meant I developed a lot of, kind of maths and statistics. But at the time, not much of that was, was really employed, other than in the, the fieldwork. So when I was at college, we did do this independent fieldwork, and it seems to have gone full circle, and this is what students are doing again now. Uh, so I went to the University of Exeter, and actually went to the, the University of Exeter's campus down in Cornwall in Falmouth. Uh, so I was really fortunate in terms of the location, and we were really close to the sea and Dartmoor. Um, and actually, being down there, that, that campus was quite new, so it meant lots of the um, academic staff there were, they'd all come from Exeter uh, and their main campus, but the idea was it was a bit, a bit more um, experimental and a bit more innovative in, in what they were doing there. Now, <clears throat> the reality of the GIS and the data skills that I, I did at university, I guess is sort of similar to um, lots of people's stories where there was a standalone topic or, or a module that was called GIS and um, we would used to go into a, um, an IT lab and just spend hours following instructions and it was quite a tedious process and so actually we didn't then apply many of those skills to, to the other things that we were doing and it didn't go beyond that topic or, or that module. Um, so I think actually the GIS experience I had was, was quite lacking, or, or, but I guess though it was sort of um, similar to lots of people at that time. Well, in terms of um, how I developed lots of these skills and interests, I mean, it, it's always telling when students say, God, you know, how on earth did you learn this? The reality is, most of my IT skills and uh, kind of wider interest come from self-led or, or sort of independently learning these things. So it's either just spending time um, having a play with certain software or um, just trying to master it myself. Uh, the reality of that now though is that there's YouTube videos and instructions and it's really easy to do that on your own and you don't need formal training. One area data and ICT has really developed and enhanced the, the sort of teaching and classroom experience is actually in field work. Now, um, previously, Departments would have to buy quite expensive, and, and they probably wouldn't, uh, GPS loggers or kind of big clunky bits of, of uh, equipment that just meant um, GIS and, and using IT to enhance what people did in fieldwork was just unattainable or inaccessible. Now the reality is, with everyone having a mobile phone, um, it's sort of proliferated and um, made collecting data much easier. So using a mobile phone, you can take photographs, um, or use some sort of basic app, apps like um, a decibel meter and then with that you can log the location so you start to collect data that is geolocated and everyone has the ability of that to, to do that with their mobile phone. Now if we go a little bit further, um, there are also then other devices that are still kind of relatively cheap that you can then plug in or connect through Bluetooth. So a good example of that is maybe this is the clean space tag and um, the idea of this is that it's basically a carbon monoxide meter that um, it, it's quite innovative actually in that it, it harvests spare Wi-Fi signal in order to charge itself. So you don't have to plug it in and the idea is you connect that up to an app and you can log um, 
the air quality during a journey, and then you build up um, sort of that clean air miles. And that's a really interesting one that we've taken on field trips. And we went to Morocco, and it was really telling in the evening when everyone was uh, cooking, and we went out onto the terraces, there were lots of uh, chimneys near us, and you could then, this picked up that dramatic difference in the air quality. Uh, another really interesting device is, is uh, this, the, the weather flow uh, weather meter, and there's quite a few sort of variations of this. So the idea is, it's a really tiny little weather station that you can plug in the top of your mobile phone, and it connects through Bluetooth. And the idea then is students can go about collecting data, and um, the, the level of accuracy and the number of significant figures of this data is just incredible. And also the, the number of variables, so things like uh, humidity, uh, wind speed, wind direction, all those sorts of ones. But there's a list of about eight different variables that it collects. And we've found this one really interesting to uh, have students collect data using the more traditional methods and, and sort of handheld devices and compare the data uh, and the scores that they get with that with this piece of equipment. The other thing that this does is it makes collecting data much quicker and an easier process. So the app tells you to hold it up and you, you, it counts 30 seconds and then once you've done that it just automatically saves it and you can just kind of run around and collect hundreds of bits of data and then when you get back into the classroom the idea is that data is then in one single table that you just um, download and share. Uh, what I wanted to do now is just show you how as a classroom teacher I use IT and I guess data and data skills to kind of enhance um, my classroom practice. Now I think as a teacher um, the way that we plan our lessons has evolved and rather than maybe in the past teachers relied more on textbooks or um, sort of printed material we've now got the internet and all of these sorts of websites at our fingertips so the way that I <coughs> go about planning a lesson now I will often find a website or a good data visualisation and that will be the beginning of my lesson um, and I might evolve, sort of plan or evolve the lesson around students exploring that kind of the data visualisation on the website. So the first one I wanted to show you was um, this Gapminder. Now I'm sure everyone's heard of Hans Rosling and the Gapminder website and there's some really interesting ways that you can use this. Now this is um, essentially a massive database of loads of, of data and you can change the variables and you can also play things through time. Uh, the, the really interesting thing with this is then the, the circles represent the size of the population and then the colours show you which region of the world it is. And you can do some quite cool things, sort of, you can set things back in time and get students to come up to the board with a post-it note and then they maybe have to guess where the life expectancy of a certain country is and so you can kind of use this as an interactive tool um, and, and like I said earlier on the idea is this is current up-to-date data sort of the most recent we've got access to and it really enriches the, uh, the classroom experience now another good source of this is maybe um, you've got this wind map so um, I mean, it's quite hypnotising, really, but you can quite quickly zoom around and see where some of the strongest winds are. So, at the moment, strongest winds in the world off the coast of Greenland. Um, again, it's just a really um, engaging and interactive tool that these students can kind of play with. This is also quite good in the sense that, as well as, as um, this was showing the wind at the surface, you can also go through those different variables. So it's got a simulation of um, current waves, or you've got ocean currents. Um, you can also change the projection, so you can change it to um, and explore kind of how projections change your perspective of different parts of the world. It's quite an interesting tool and a cool one for students to play around with. Now, another good one is maybe with more of a focus on population, um, particularly with the increasing focus of sense of place and exploring places in the A-level. Now, DataShine is um, a visualisation of all of the census data. So the, the data comes from the census and uh, you can explore all sorts of things. So say we were to look terms of 
gender split of places, so you can explore where it has a higher proportion of males. What's quite good with this is um, it also gets students to start exploring how you might represent the data. So you can, um, you can look at things like location quotient. Um, so if we were to explore, let's take Winchester, Kind of, it's a really visual tool in the sense that it hits you. Um, you can see the areas that are green have a higher proportion of men, the red areas a higher proportion of women. And what you can do is you can sort of explore that idea and um, start to think why. It's a really interesting one to think why. Um, you've got things like looking at general health. Now, general health of Winchester are pretty good in general, but you've got certain areas here where there's pockets of real poor health, so the red areas are areas with less good health. So it's a really interesting way to start students off in exploring a place, and the idea is you're kind of using data to inform that rather than just kind of general opinions and people's perspectives. Um, another good website, this is the Google Public Data Directory. And the idea with this is you've got access to, a bit like Gapminder, loads of different um, data sources. So the World Trade Organization, the World Bank, um, the um, World Economic Forum. And it's the same sort of thing where you can kind of interactively explore and play with the data. Um, another really good tool here is population pyramids, so interactive population pyramids. Kind of click through and you can see for every single country in the world you can also then um, look at different regions you can look at the world in general um, and then you can also go back in time so you can look at maybe what was the population pyramid for um, the world in 2012 or go somewhere there's some really interesting ones if you go to a place like Qatar you've got a real male skew but it's again really obvious and easy to see and then you could maybe um, 2017 you can kind of keep playing through time so the population pyramids I mean another good one then this is migration you can kind of interactively see where people are coming from and to and uh, click on certain countries and it tells you um, as well as a bit of data about them kind of who's where people are coming from so highest proportion of people coming into India are from Bangladesh um, take China, highest proportion of people from um, South Korea going into China. So what's really important to remember though is that the purpose of these sorts of websites and the idea that you might use them is not the websites and the data visualizations in themselves. You know, you wouldn't take students to data shine just to kind of explore and have a look at it just for the sake of it. The idea is you're using these tools and, and the real benefit is using them to get to the geography quicker or for students to be able to access the geography more easily. So the idea is you might look at this and then start thinking about the reasons why or start to explore why might. One of the, the questions I always ask students is why is it there's very little wind on some of the largest land masses. And it's, it's being able to use this to then ask these questions and access that geography quicker that's the real benefit. One of the last things I just wanted to um, talk about was our weather station. So I heard of this through Kickstarter, which is a crowdfunding platform, and there's loads of great ideas on there, and it's really interesting, lots of them often you can link to the classroom and specifically link to geography, but um, this one, it's called the Bloom Sky um, Storm and Sky, which is a kind of weather station, and the idea is it's, it's a new generation in the sense that it's not as expensive, so it's, it's relatively cheap, com especially compared to previous weather stations that schools might have had. It's also much easier to set up, so there's far less knowledge and um, kind of technical necessity. This simply connects through Wi-Fi, and it's also solar powered, so there's no need to have some sort of power connection to it. And you just um, put it out there, turn it on, and then you can start um, collecting data. What's really interesting about this is it also um, has a HD camera on the top and the idea is it creates a time lapse. It takes a photograph every five minutes and it takes a time lapse of the day. Just go outside here to have a look at the weather station. This is the Bloom Sky. It comes in two parts. Um, there's this device which has the camera on the top of it and records uh, the temperature, humidity, 
Um, and then this one here, that does wind speed, wind direction and precipitation, and they both link through Wi-Fi and connect up with um, a website. So there's a live feed of data that anyone can access. And then it also links through to our own dashboard that we can view the data in more detail. Google Drive has been really useful with field work and we've set up shared spreadsheets that have automatically collected uh, averages. One of the examples was with um, Lower Down in the school, we do sort of a microclimates investigation, and in that, the students go around and collect data using more traditional um, pieces of equipment, and then they input that data out in the field um, into this shared spreadsheet. Each class, there's um, four classes, they each have their own spreadsheet, and at the end of that, there's then a spreadsheet that collates that and automatically calculates the averages. And then that means that um, they then just pull that averages data set out, and that's the one that they then use. Google Drive has also been really useful in setting up shared documents for revision. So, sort of almost crowdsourcing the information so that students input a little bit, another student inputs another bit, and then they can respond to and change and improve the information that other students put together. So this one was all about named examples, so looking at specific places that they'd, they'd um, collect the information for throughout the course, and then they collated that into this big document that listed in a really succinct way all of the information, which came about much quicker than if it were done individually because the students sort of shared their resources and shared their time.